In the headlines, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un writes letters to a former South Korean first lady and Hyundai Group's chairwoman thanking them for their condolences over his late father and vowing to do his best for a Korean unification. Investigators say multiple IP addresses based in China were used in the recent cyber attack on nuclear reactors in South Korea. The hacker is threatening more information leaks if authorities do not shut down three reactors by Christmas. And Christmas is here, but celebrations seem muted in terms of holiday spending. The latest consumer sentiment index dips to a 15-month low. Welcome to the program. You're watching Primetime News, coming to you live from Seoul on this Christmas Eve. I am Kang Teddy. And I'm Sean Lim. Thanks for joining us tonight on this festive holiday. We begin with a move by North Korean leader Kim Jong-un to improve bilateral ties with South Korea after a South Korean delegation made a trip to the inter-Korean industrial complex on this Wednesday. And the group, which included a former first lady and the Hyundai group of chairwoman, came back with something special. Letters from the North Korean leader Kim Hyun-bin has the details. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un has promised efforts to move towards unification of the two Koreas. His message came in a form of a letter passed on to former South Korean First Lady Lee Hyo via a South Korean delegation that visited the North on Wednesday. Her late husband, former South Korean President Kim Dae-jung, held the first ever in a Korean summit in 2000. He also wrote a letter to Hyundai Group Chairwoman Hyun Jong-un, wishing success in her business. An affiliate in her group operates an Korean tourism project that's been suspended since 2008. In both letters, he expresses thanks for their condolences on the third anniversary of his father Kim Jong-il's death earlier this month. And Kim Jong-un's warm message resonated with the messenger as well. Kim yang kwon North Korea's top official in charge of inter-Korean affairs, reportedly said he hopes for improved inter-Korean relations when he passed on the letters. Kim Hyun-bin, Arirang News. And some select theaters in the USA, they are willing to screen the movie, The Interview. Sony Pictures was more than happy to take them up on this offer, but the country's biggest movie chains are still reluctant. Our Chi myung gil has more. In what some are calling a victory for Hollywood, Sony Pictures says it is now going to release The Interview, a comedy film which depicts the fictional assassination of North Korean leader Kim Jong-un in some U.S. theaters after all. In a statement, the studio's chief executive, Michael Linton, said they had never given up on releasing the movie and that they were excited it will be shown in a number of theaters from Christmas Day. One of the stars of the movie, Seth Rogen, tweeted that the people had spoken and freedom had prevailed. The New York Times reports that the biggest theater chains in the U.S. are still unlikely to screen the film. But Sony will likely be able to patch together distribution in two to three hundred smaller independent theaters. Representatives from the four largest theater chains in the U.S. have declined to comment, only saying that negotiations over the film's release were ongoing. A week ago, Sony scrapped the release of its 44 million U.S. dollar film after their systems were hacked and threats were made against U.S. movie theater chains. The cyber attack was blamed on North Korea and the threats of violence caused major chains to pull the film due to security concerns. The interview has been at the center of escalating tensions between the U.S. and North Korea, with Pyongyang denying it has anything to do with the attack. The White House said President Barack Obama welcomed Sony's decision, as America is a country that believes in free speech. He had earlier criticized Sony's initial decision to cancel the release. Sony Pictures says it will continue to secure more platforms and more theaters so the movie reaches the largest possible audience in the U.S. Kim Young-gil, Arirang News. 
A U.S. based research group says North Korea's internet connection was partially down again on this Wednesday. That comes a day after internet access was totally blocked for some 10 hours. A clear answer on who or what may have caused this outage is not known yet, but what's clear is that the U.S. is not saying much about this, about its possible involvement. Our Shin Min has more. The U.S. State Department is sidestepping questions on whether the U.S. had a hand in North Korea's internet outage on Monday. Spokesperson Marie Harf told reporters that there was no new information to share about the issue, but added that U.S. President Barack Obama had spoken about the potential responses separate and apart from what we've seen over the past 24 hours, and that it was up to North Korea to address the state of their internet. Tuesday's press briefing came a day after Harf indicated that not all U.S. responses to the hacking would be immediately evident. President Obama repeatedly vowed of a proportional response to what he called the cyber vandalism on Sony. The U.S. is reportedly weighing a new round of financial sanctions on Pyongyang that would target the banks and trading companies used by leader Kim Jong-un and other North Korean officials. The U.S. is also reviewing whether to put North Korea back on its list of state sponsors of terrorism. However, such measures would largely be symbolic. North Korea is already among the most heavily sanctioned countries on Earth, and Harv said there wouldn't be a large practical effect of additional sanctions. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. Authorities looking into who is leaking documents from South Korea's nuclear power plant operators say it doesn't appear to be a one-man job. And they now have a better idea of where the attack may have originated. This as an ominous Christmas deadline looms. Connie Kim has the details. The investigation team is closing in on the hacker who is threatening to release thousands of nuclear reactor data. Authorities say they've tracked the attack to multiple IP addresses in Shenyang, China. And they haven't ruled out North Korea's involvement since the city is close to the border. Authorities believe the attack was planned for two years and that more than one person is responsible. They had discovered earlier in the week that the Twitter ID being used by the hacker was registered in the U.S. South Korea has asked both Beijing and Washington for assistance in their probe. The group of hackers has leaked documents on five separate occasions over the last week. The most recent was on Tuesday, which included crucial information about nuclear technology. They've threatened to release tens of thousands of additional documents related to the nation's nuclear reactors and destroy control systems if their demands are not met. Those demands? Halt operations at three of Korea's nuclear facilities by Christmas Day or face the consequences. And experts say such a leak could be detrimental. The hackers say they have about 100,000 pieces of data. Even if that data is not highly classified, it can be reassembled, creating a huge chunk of new information. Then it becomes very dangerous. And in response to the recent security breach, the Energy Ministry conducted a two-day-long cybersecurity drill this week on all of Korea's nuclear facilities. The network security of power plants was reviewed, as was protocol for shutting them down in the case of a malfunction. The energy ministry raised its alert level against cyber attacks one notch to the third highest level of caution on Tuesday. Connie Kim, Arirang News. The history of Christmas here in Korea is not as long as many would think. It was first introduced to Korea around 1880. And during the 60s and 70s, while Korea was under a strict curfew, the only days to have the curfew lifted were Christmas Eve and Christmas. So this international holiday spread quickly through Korea's history. And over the course of 130 years, Christmas has taken on many different forms. Our immunity he has this special holiday report with a look at a very special festival. So, what does Christmas of the 21st century look like? Well, it's become more festive and more merry than ever before. <laughs> to alleviate some of the stress and hardship of 2014, Sadamun has created something very special. 
a street dedicated entirely to a Christmas street festival. They've blocked the roads and decked the halls to spread the Christmas cheer. And it's not every day you can hug Santa, or many Santas for that matter, each eagerly waiting to warm the spirits of all with their free hugs. From coloring ceramic figurines with your family, to making hand-punched and printed Christmas cards with friends, a row of festive do-it-yourself booths await to entertain those passing by. And of course, Christmas wouldn't be the same without a tray of Santa's favorite cookies. Each dollop of frosting and ornate decoration precisely placed by hand. Because Rudolph once told me that Santa likes his cookies homemade. Once the sun goes down, the party isn't over. Bright lights and twinkling stars ignite the skies. Christmas is definitely in the air. But as this is a festival of a rather special nature, you can't forget the music. And it doesn't always need to be all prim and proper. These musicians are here with a rock and roll of a good time for an audience ready to dance the night away. Even though December means freezing temperatures outside, the cold doesn't stop these people warm with the Christmas spirit. Under a festive night sky, it's time to jingle all the way, because this year there's a merry, merry Christmas waiting for you. Im Yoon Hee, Arirang News. Well, Christmas certainly is here, but I don't know about you. To me, it seems like the Christmas mood is somewhat subdued even more mm. this year. That is in terms of holiday spending and festivities. Exactly. I mean, this is what we talked about in uh, our afternoon meeting today, too. But I mean, shoppers are there, but not so much of carols and not enough shoppers. I don't think uh, I've seen a lot of parties even. It's just not uh, what it used to be, I guess. Right. And that's not surprising mm. given that consumer sentiment in Korea has not been so strong this year. First, it was the ferry accident in April, and now economists say mm. other factors mm. are weighing heavy on the consumer sentiment. Our Kwon so has the latest figures. Korean consumers are not feeling too good at the moment, with the nation's consumer sentiment hitting a 15-month low in December. The Bank of Korea says its consumer sentiment index stood at 102, falling 0.1 point to drop for the third straight month. Although the reading is slightly above 100, indicating optimists outnumber pessimists, it was lower compared to May, right after the Seolo ferry disaster, which dampened consumption countrywide. Experts say that to tackle sluggish domestic demand, more needs to be done to raise consumer confidence so businesses are encouraged to invest. The government's monetary policies seem to have improved conditions in August and September, but despite another rate cut in October, things are worsening, raising concerns that planned structural reforms may not have been that effective. When uh, in interest rates fall, Typically, people, we want people to borrow more, to uh, consume more, uh, buy more housing or invest more. But because we have such a high debt uh, for households, they're not, uh, they're not really borrowing that much to spend. So that path toward higher consumption and higher investment is very weak right now. The central bank says external factors such as falling international oil prices and Russia's currency crisis are also dragging on Koreans' consumer sentiment. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. U.S. Congressman Mike Honda is known for his activities dedicated to resolving Japan's wartime sexual enslavement issue. But he says talking to Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe about that topic is a waste of time. 
Our Huang Chengyi has more on Honda's alternative proposal. Representative Mike Honda says it would be a waste of energy and time to put pressure on Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe about Japan's wartime sexual slavery because he has no interest in resolving the issue. In an interview with Seoul-based Yonhap News Agency, Honda said South Korea and the United States should increase pressure at the grassroots level and make them understand that this is a necessity for Japan to do in order to become fully accepted. Honda added the Japanese population over the last two and a half generations has been ignorant about the country's wartime crimes since their government has not been teaching children about it. The congressman recently made a five-day visit to Korea and met with some of the surviving former sex slaves as well as President Park Geun-hye. Honda played a leading role raising U.S. awareness about the issue, including making House Resolution 121, which urges Japan to formally acknowledge, apologize and accept historical responsibility into a law. Saying that time is running out for the elderly victims, Honda said he is open to taking fresh action in Congress. But Honda said it is time for the White House and the State Department to turn up the heat and turn the screws on Japan for a sincere apology. However, with his landslide victory in recent snap elections, experts expect Abe to walk a clear path of an ultra-right-wing leader who wants to see Japan restored to what he believes was its wartime greatness. Hwang Sang-hee, Arirang News. Islamic State militants say they are preparing for the world's largest religious cleansing by murder. That's according to the first ever Western journalist who is granted in extensive access to the jihadist group. With more return to Paul Yi at the News Center. Uh, Paul, this veteran reporter recently spent 10 days in IS controlled areas in Syria and Iraq. What did he discover? Well, in this rare glimpse into the inner workings of the Islamic State, Jurgen Tonahofer said the fanatics' religious followers still maintain a brutal grip on power in the region. After safely returning home, he warned that IS is stronger and much more dangerous than Western leaders realize. Our Connie Lee reports. The first ever Western journalist to have direct access to the Islamic State in Syria and Iraq has returned with a strong warning about the militant group has the power of a nuclear tsunami. It's incredible. I, I, I was so amazed. I, I, I couldn't understand this enthusiasm. In an interview with ABC News and BBC Radio, the 74-year-old German journalist who traveled with the militants through territories they control says their official philosophy was brutal religious cleansing. We will conquer Europe someday. We will for sure. We'll kill 150 million to 100 million, 500 million. The journalist describes how he saw hundreds of fighters from all over the world arriving in IS territories each day to join the group. He says he's pessimistic that any Western country will be able to stop them. The inside look comes on the heels of a report from Amnesty International, which shows the horrifying reality that women and girls face under the Islamic State. The report says hundreds of women, especially from the Yazidi tribe, are tortured, sexually assaulted, and that girls even younger than 14 years old are held as sex slaves. I am hungry, but it's better than getting sexually assaulted. I can take it all, but I just can't bear the thought of young girls being raped. Across Syria and Iraq, in the midst of rubble and destroyed buildings, are the tens of thousands of Yazidi refugees who have fled the violence of the militants. Connie Lee, Arirang News. And turning to the United States, a fresh government report shows the world's largest economy has expanded at its fastest pace in over a decade. The strong figures pushed up major indices on the U.S. stock market to new record highs, raising hopes of an extended recovery into next year. Our Kim Jian tells us more. The world's largest economy grew at an annual rate of 5 percent during the July to September period, the fastest rate of expansion since 2003, and higher than the government's earlier estimate of 3.9 percent. Economists point to strong consumption, especially on health care services. Consumer spending jumped 3.2 percent, its biggest jump this year. Two-thirds of the U.S. economy is related to consumption, 
and history would suggest that business investment lags consumption or lags economic growth. So if the overall economy is starting to accelerate, then 2015 could also be a fairly strong business investment climate. The data boosts stocks on Wall Street, lifting the Dow Jones above 18,000 for the first time ever. The S&P 500 also closed at a record high. Growth projections in the fourth quarter are expected to record an annual rate of around 2.5 percent and 3 percent next year, putting weight that the U.S. Federal Reserve will stay on course and starts raising interest rates by mid-2015. Boosted by the strengthening labor market and falling oil prices, consumer outlays are expected to help cushion the U.S. economy from uncertainties in China and the Eurozone and a recession in Japan. Kim Jong, Arirang News. And finally, the holiday spirit is spreading across the globe on this Christmas Eve. Of course, each country has its own take on festive traditions, especially when it comes to Santa Claus. Volunteers took to the streets in Thailand's central province today, this time with the help of elephants. Donning St. Nick's iconic costume and white beard, the group of elephants used their trunks to distribute presents and joy to children of all ages. Organizers say the Christmas campaign event was well received with crowds of cheering fans. And that wraps up our look at international stories for now. I'll see you back here on Friday. Hello and welcome. I'm Stephen Che with a look at sports. Previously, we talked about how Kim yeon was the top sports story of 2014 in Korea. Now we go over to the U.S., where the sports pages were splattered with this year with scandals that rocked American football. U.S. news editors and directors voted domestic violence in the National Football League as the biggest sports story this year. In February, video footage of former Baltimore Ravens star Ray Rice punching his now wife Janae Rice in an elevator surfaced, forcing the NFL to take action. But the league's top office was seen to have bungled the case in various ways, stirring the ire of the public. And second on the list was former L.A. Clippers owner De Donald Sterling's ban from the NBA. And at number three was NBA star LeBron James returning to his hometown Cleveland Cavaliers. And coming closer to home in the KBL, all-star voting wrapped up and fans voted for KGC's Osegun the most. But he sat with an injury Wednesday night as we head to the tip-off in Kunzan. Despite being without their big man, KGC doesn't miss a beat behind Leon Williams, who records a double-double. They get the five-point win over KCC to rebound from their latest loss. And over to Wonju, the KT Sonic Boom win the seesaw battle over the Dongbu Promi and even fight back from a three-point second quarter. Lee do is effective in just 26 minutes, leading his team to the big win. Heading to pro volleyball and going to the action in Kumi for the LIG Graders taking on the OK Savings Bank Russian Cash. And the Russian Cash are aggressive from the get-go and have no problem centering their attack around Simon, who has four more aces in this one. LIG are ultimately outmatched as OK Savings takes it in three sets. And finally to the NBA, the struggling Los Angeles Lakers without star Kobe Bryant stunned the NBA's top team, the Golden State Warriors, 115-105. Coach Byron Scott made the call to sit the Lakers' alpha dog for rest after the veteran went 8-for-30 in the last game. Bryant is shooting a dismal 37% from the field and his efficiency numbers show he may actually be hurting the team. Now the win is a bright spot, but the Lakers coach has some tough decisions on how to play or not to play Kobe, the franchise star and living legend. And that wraps it up for sports. Your weather's up next. Have a happy holiday and good night. Hope you're having a wonderful Christmas Eve. I'm Kim Bo-kyung with the weather updates. 
We got to enjoy a mild winter day, warmer than the seasonal average under mostly clear skies. But cold air is gradually moving in, and a cold wave watch has been issued for the northern part of the country. And this will lead to freezing conditions from later tonight through early tomorrow morning. So make sure to dress warmly. Well, the morning low on Christmas Day will dip to minus six before rising to three in the afternoon. Temperatures then should be favorable for spending time outdoors. Other than that, it looks like you can expect moderate winter temperatures to stick around for the rest of the week. Taking a look at tomorrow's readings, Seoul makes it to three, Daegu six, Gwangju makes it to five. On to other regions. Daejeon and Tokyo reach four, Mount Kumgang drops to minus eight. Those are all the updates we're following at this hour. Happy holidays, and I'll be back with more after midnight. See you then. And that's primetime news on this Christmas Eve. Happy holidays, everyone. I'm Sean Lim. And uh, I'm Kang Tae. Uh, Merry Christmas uh, to my partner, Sean, and our viewers as well. Happy holidays. Thanks for watching, and we'll be back here on Friday. Good night.